Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome back to my channel. Uh, today I'm going to be just finishing off my roundups of my favourite books of 2020, uh, this time focusing on the fiction. Um, and so uh, I'm going to start off uh, this video with talking about my uh, top choices of books released this year and then I'll put in a separate video all of my favourite books I've read this year that weren't released this year. First up is one of my absolute favourite books from this year, which was Summer Water by Sarah Moss. Um, I hadn't really heard of Sarah Moss at all until this year, and um, I kind of only really found it because I'd heard a couple of people sort of talking about Summer Water, and then the library app I was using had the audiobook, and I thought, cool, yeah, why not? It's a short book, it's a really short audiobook, um, so let's, yeah, let's just kind of give it a try. And I was absolutely blown away by the sheer force and um, and kind of character of her language. It's very, I, I don't quite know how to describe it in some ways, but it, it feels so alive and so raw. Um, and I always really appreciate authors who have a really strong sense of voice um, and whose prose and writing style is so kind of um, intricate and detailed and interesting. Um, and so I absolutely fell in love with this book. Um, so this is about a group of um, people all on holiday, um, but they kind of basically get round, uh, rained out in the sort of Scottish countryside. Um, and as a result, the kind of, the group sort of has a bit too much time on their hands and they sort of turn on each other in a little bit. And it's one of all these little um, interpersonal dramas and, and, uh, and kind of, disagreements I guess um, but it is it's such a short book that that it, what I really love when short fiction for me is done really really well I mean this is why sometimes I think I I lean towards short books or books that are quite long because I kind of for books that are kind of in the middle I sometimes get lost um, but for books that are really short like this I love when there's that that's that sense of pace is really continued throughout so it feels like an exhilarating ride for three or four hours where the writing doesn't let up where it's just you know dramatic and tense and interesting and, and that's what I really loved about this book um I've since gone and read a few more of Sarah Moss's books and just been absolutely amazed by how she writes it's there's something so brutal about her language um and in a way that I really love it's it you know it has its moments of tenderness it has its moments of softness um but she is not afraid as an author to just kind of have her characters say and do things, have the narrator just sort of flat out say certain things. Um, and so I think she's an author who I'm really excited about um, for, for reading future books. And I also read uh, Ghost Wall and uh, The Tidal Zone by her this year. And I was equally impressed by all three. Um, I just think she's a stunning force of literature and I'm kind of annoyed that it's taken me this long to, to find out about her. But yes, absolutely wonderful, wonderful author. Next, and in no particular order, um, Eliza Clark with Boy Parts. Um, I had kind of seen this in a couple of bookshops when they were temporarily open this year, and um, I had kind of thought it looked really interesting just from the cover alone, and I thought it kind of, you know, but I hadn't really heard much about it. I hadn't heard really anybody else talking about it. Um, and then I kind of saw it available on my, uh, from my library again, and just thought, okay, let's give this a go. And I really loved uh, this. So it, it's um, about a, um, a woman who is a photographer, but a lot of her photography involves um, taking pictures of men in various sort of sexualized or kind of feminized or, or whatever kind of position. So, um, for example, either in a kind of sexualized way with her being kind of a, a sort of dominatrix over them, uh, but also um, other kind of various arty ways that those pictures are taken. Um, now on the surface of it that kind of just sounds like yeah you know it could be fairly interesting but I think what really rises this uh, like rises this above that um, kind of level for me or above that storyline is just the the intricacy of the language. It's really tense, it's really um, dramatic um, and again kind of like the Sarah Moss really unafraid to be brutal and quite fierce in her language and I love that I just think it was really stunning and it builds and builds to this really um, quite bizarre ending in some ways where you start realizing that the character's uh, sort of sense of reality is sort of shifting 
Um, and that is really powerful, not only um, in the narrative itself. I kind of love when that happens, when na narrators really start to doubt themselves. Um, but I also really love how that works in sense of photography. So um, you've got a narrator not trusting herself, but the idea that, that you know, the camera never lies. Um, but she is the photographer is lying or believes she is or sometimes doesn't really know what the truth is anymore. Um, I just I thought it was masterful. Um, a really good read and for once this year as well a book that i read that wasn't part of a book prize shortlist uh, which i was very very grateful for um yeah so i just think uh, boy parts is absolutely stunning um and uh, from an author again who i think is fairly new um and i'm really excited to see what she comes up with next um, i think it's going to be great the next two books I want to talk about have a really specific feel for 2020. Um, I do think I would have adored them and they would have been in my top list had 2020 not been what it has been. Uh, but I think for both of them, it's a real testament to just um, the power of their voice and how relatable they've managed to make some of these uh, works of literature be. Um, so the first is Summer by Ali Smith. Um, so, you know, with 2020 being what it is, in some ways the idea of having someone writing about the, that year <laughs> is not what you really want you know you sort of think off the top of your head that you don't really want to be engaging with it anymore you want escapism you want whatever else but i think what is so brilliant about ali smith is how she offers you both an insight into what's actually happening um at that time so you know the, the the book coming out when it did caught just the beginning parts of the the pandemic um and so she gives you kind of insights into some of those parts and into sort of some of the years preceding um but i think one thing she also offers you is a real sense of hope and a real sense of joy um i raced through this book absolutely raced through it and i uh i'd read spring just before it so i i kind of had sort of paused the the, the quartet just after winter um, and read spring and summer pretty much back to back and I was just blown away by this book. I I forget every time until I read Ali Smith again, just how joyous she is, how much fun she seems to have as a writer in engaging with ideas, in making characters do things. And that sense of joy was so present throughout this book. Um, and I, I found it really quite moving and emotional at the end. Um, it ends on such a, a positive note around kind of looking after each other and about hope. Um, which is not only great for this year um but is also just something that means so so much to have in literature anyway it's a comforting read and a book that i really want to go back to um it also brings together all of the stories from the previous um kind of books of the quartet so you've got a few kind of uh, characters who are shown to be interlinked in various ways um and I mean, it's almost quite difficult to talk about the plot of the summer in some ways, because, you know, we, we're focusing on sort of different characters. Um, and I just urge you to go and read the whole quartet if you haven't read it, or at least finish it if you haven't. Um, I just, I think Ali Smith is masterful and I am very excited to be living in the same time uh, of, of the world as Ali Smith and just to be able to, to get her books as and when they come out. And the next book uh, that is also very related to 2020, although albeit with a much different lens, is uh, Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell, um, a book that rightly in my mind won the Women's Prize. And I just think this is stunning. Um, I resisted reading it for a really long time, uh, partly because I wanted to get it from the library and, and not spend 20 quid on it, uh, but also uh, just because I was worried that with all of the hype and love around Hamnet, that I would really not like it. Um, and I ended up loving it. I just thought this book was beautiful. Um, so it's all about, I, I speak about it a little bit in my Women's Prize video, but it focuses on um, the kind of on Shakespeare's uh, wife, Agnes, um, and uh, her, well, their children, and particularly the death of Hamnet, um, who then uh, is believed was the, the sort of inspiration behind Shakespeare writing Hamlet, uh, the play. And um, I just think this book is just so clever, not only in terms of the, the, the delicacy and warmth of the language, every word feels very precise, um, but also just that it, it really kind of dares to imagine a different world and a different history um, or a kind of a preferred history in some ways of what the story was behind Shakespeare's wife. Um, 
and I, I just think it's beautiful. It's just such an incredible piece of work. Um, I found it really moving and obviously the fact that it deals with the plague um, is something that felt very, very relevant to 2020. Um, especially there are whole scenes about theatres being closed um, and about people being terrified of finding marks on people or, you know, about people being sick and, and the kind of general malaise and fear around all of that, which is, you know, a little bit relatable this year. And I think even on top of that, just, you know, there are so many little beautiful insights from it. Um, a scene that really sticks in my mind really strongly um, is just this this point of view shift of watching fleas spread the initial strains of the plague, which doesn't sound like it should work, um, but we are literally just watching fleas hop from animal to person to animal and it's so cleverly done, you know, it's only maybe five pages or so, um, but it, it's just so powerfully uh, rendered. And I, I just think Maggie Fowler is brilliant. I need to go back and read her work because I realised this Hamlet is the first I've read of her. I've, I've known her name for a while and just never sat down and read her. Um, but I've heard really positive things about a lot of her work. So yes, I need to go back and do that. Uh, but yes, that's Hamlet by Maggie O'Farrell. Next up is a book that I avoided for a really long time. I bought it actually, I think pretty much when it came out, um, because I saw Bernadine Evaristo talking about it and, you know, singing its praises. And that's The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. Um, but I'd heard so much love and praise for it. Um, but at the same time, I think early on, I saw a couple of reviews that really uh, kind of didn't like it. And for some reason in my head, that sort of translated into, yes, I've got this book here but let's focus on all the library books that I need to give uh, back to the library at some point. Um, let's do that. Um, and I just kept on putting it off and putting it off. And it was kind of only really the thinking that I would be making an end of year video um, talking about my reads of 2020 that I thought I kind of can't avoid this book. Like this is a book that has been spoken about so much that so many people have raved about. Um, I've probably got to give it a go. And I'm really glad I did. Um, uh, the Vanishing Half is such a brilliantly thought out book. Um, so it concerns the idea of these two twin sisters um, who are both fairly light skinned uh, black people. And um, as a result, they in various circumstances can sort of pass, I guess for want of a better word, as white. Um, and so essentially the twins at one point uh, split up and go about their own lives. Um, one twin sort of stays uh, kind of in the town where they where they grew up um, and is kind of seen as sort of you know a light-skinned black woman. Um, the other sister, uh, Stella, she um, tries basically to pass as white. She sort of does it by one at uh, once as a sort of game with herself to try and get into a museum I think it was and um, it does it, it, it works and she's sort of mystified by this and she essentially then models her whole life on being white um, and kind of has this whole sort of secret identity um, and so what's really interesting about the book is I think in the hands of a less accomplished writer this could be a really great idea that just falls flat and that's I think why I was really nervous about reading it because I thought it was going to be great idea poor execution I don't know why I thought that but I think I, I just thought it was such a, an interesting idea for a book that I don't know I was nervous that it wouldn't it wouldn't be done uh, wouldn't be done that well and uh, I think Britt Bennett handles it beautifully um, I found myself really caring about the characters and um getting really quite swept along in the narrative of it all um it's it's got a really interesting set of sort of side characters as well um so i mean it's not necessarily a side character but the daughter of one of the twins um because the the father was a sort of darker skinned black man she definitely doesn't sort of pass as white and you know she is very clearly seen by everyone as being a black woman and particularly in the time um a lot of people comment on just sort of you know how dark she is um so much so that the twin sister the the white twin sister doesn't recognize her as kind of you know couldn't possibly conceive of her as being related to her when when they do eventually meet um 
but obviously the um, the daughter recognizes this woman who looks a lot like her mother immediately. Um, and I think uh, to the, the daughter is really well rendered, I think, and is really cleverly done um, as a kind of foil to the other characters. She's the sort of detective almost working out behind the scenes. Um, as well as her, you've got um, her, um, her kind of her partner, at least for a good amount of the book, called uh, Reese, who um, is a trans man. And I, I have to admit, I was a little bit nervous when I sort of initially saw that a trans man was also kind of in the book because I was worried that, it, you know, I think with trans people are so rarely in books that you kind of really hope that they're done very, very well when they are in them. Um, and speaking as someone who's not trans myself, I, I can't necessarily give an expert opinion on this, but I thought it, I thought that Reese was done really, really well. Um, and I, I don't know why all that beeping was. I thought Reese was done really, really well. Um, a really beautiful character. Um, everyone in this book is so sort of fully rounded, like they're, they're warm, and brilliant and excellent and flawed. Um, but I think all done with the right level of it. And so I, I just think this is a brilliant book. Um, I totally see now why it was on so many people's best of um, year end lists, you know, including a lot of magazines and publications. Um, I think it's really well done. And uh, yeah, I'm kind of surprised in some ways that Brit Bennett wasn't uh, kind of shortlisted for a few more awards with this kind of book. Um, I know a few people were saying that they kind of expected that this would be a uh, really great kind of booker fodder actually. And I would have definitely taken this book over a lot of the long list uh, for this year's booker. Um, I think it does, the discussions are on sort of certain topics a lot better than perhaps some of the other books on the on the long list. Uh, but yes, really brilliant book. Next up, a book that I thought was really beautiful, and that's Box Hill by Adam Mars Jones. Now, I'd read some short stories by Adam Mars Jones before and loved them, uh, and so I was really excited to see that he had a novel because I hadn't, I didn't really beyond those short stories, I hadn't really read anything of his. Um, it's a really short little book uh, by Fitzcarraldo Press, and they are a really great little press um, because they have just been churning out this incredible set of um, books. They've been a lot of the, you know, kind of every, pretty much every year, there's at least one of their books on the International Booker Prize shortlist. Um, they just have a really interesting insight. Um, they just pick authors and works that are so sort of unexpected in some ways and I think sometimes that's the joy of being a smaller press is you can kind of be a little bit more creative perhaps with, with some of these things um, and it's so brilliant to see. Uh, Box Hill I thought was a, a gorgeous little novel um, so it's really short um, but it's about um, a a young man who sort of falls into a sort of relationship, quite literally falls into, he trips over uh, a man, um, a biker who is sleeping um, and they start up a relationship. Um, and these two men um, have this really kind of bizarre, almost sort of dom-sub relationship. Um, uh, and he, he uh, the, the young man is sort of introduced to this, um, this kind of biker world um, and this is a world in which there's a, a strong sense of hierarchy and um, again with the dom sub thing it's kind of presumed that the, the sub young man will kind of be up for almost anything and will be kind of shared amongst the group um, and I think this is what's really interesting about this book is we haven't really seen many stories like this um, being published um, and at least not ones that are so successfully done as this, because it never really seems to to sort of fall over into just being, um, not to kind of undermine sort of erotic fiction or whatever, but it doesn't just become that. And I think it so easily could be a story that just sort of became a bit sexy, a bit raunchy, and that was kind of it. But I think what's so clever about it is it really explores some of those intricacies around a dom sub relationship. Um, but it also really explores the ideas of memory and of loss and of grief. Um, there are some really poignant scenes towards the end where this young man has sort of grown up um, and is now looking back on his life. Um, and I, I love books where characters look back on their lives wistfully. That's apparently my thing. Um, and I just think it's so cleverly done. There's a real sense of place. Um, Box Hill is actually not too far from where I live. Um, and so now I kind of want to go and explore this and see if I can actually find some of the places in the book. Um, 
but yeah for me i just think it's such a beautiful uh way of telling a story that's so unexpected and so um out of the ordinary um it has a really strong kind of 80s feel um throughout as well um which is really interesting as well because obviously that's just sort of leading up into the sort of aids uh, aids epidemic and um the kind of fears around that i just it's it's so cleverly done and i think the fact that the, the main character spends so much of the book looking back um somebody on goodreads i think called the book quite conversational in tone i think that's kind of it it's it kind of the character sort of jumps around a little bit in his thoughts but it feels like a, a somebody you might know he feels like a very real person who might have been in this relationship talking about talking about how it all went and about his thoughts and feelings about it all i i think it's really clever um and yeah again sort of why fitzcarraldo editions are just so brilliant in my mind um because they just come up with you know they they kind of give these platforms to writers to kind of create really interesting intriguing work um so yeah absolutely brilliant book a quick addition while we're talking about the Fitzcarraldo Press is um, Hurricane Season by Fernanda Melchior. Um, I really enjoyed this book. It perhaps it didn't make my sort of top 10 of the list, but I still think it's worth um, a shout out in its own right. Um, Hurricane Season is about the death of a witch and the sort of local townspeople kind of in their reactions to it and kind of their, their way in kind of being involved in it. This uh book i just think i mean lots of people have sort of spoken about how much they love it it's so um brilliantly done in my mind because of how tense the language is it almost doesn't have any paragraph breaks i don't think it has any actually um some of the sentences go on for pages and pages and pages because it's just delivered with this very fast talking um almost sort of spitballing kind of pace um which I think is really effective because it, it brings so much of the tension in it. So much of the language is so brutal and violent um, and so much of the content is as well that I think that's what makes it really work for me is just that it kind of feels so, like a sort of rapid flow of almost angry invective at times um, and sometimes really tender beautiful moments. Um, the reason it's probably not in my top 10 is I did find the speed of that maybe a bit exhausting. I think maybe it was a mistake to read it over sort of just over a day um because i think that that really wears you out because of just how fast like how thick and fast that that text comes at you um but i still think it's a really brilliant book um, and i still think it deserves its own little shout out even if it didn't necessarily make my top 10. and now kill Supreze. here are some books that were also on the book along list this year um which i absolutely adored this year um, so the first up almost needs no introduction at this point, and that's Shuggy Bane by Douglas Stewart. Um, I've spoken about it a lot in my 2020 video uh, and in my reaction to the win, but I just think that this book is stunning. I'm so glad it won the Booker Prize. Um, it is all about a young boy in Glasgow called Shuggy, who is looking after his alcoholic mother. Um, and uh, he, it, it's so tender, and I think, so generous as a book we're given so many characters so many insights into characters um lives and and none of them are wholly irredeemable and i think that's what's so beautiful about this is it feels like there's so much love and forgiveness um in the book in some ways and i just think given the life that shuggy had and some of it being mirrored on douglas stewart's own life I, I just think it takes real courage to be that vulnerable and that open, uh, but also be that that sort of so so willing to love. Um, for me, one of the the greatest Booker Prize winners I've read actually, I think, um, and I just I think it's remarkable. Next up is a uh, is a book that if Shuggy Bain hadn't won, this would be my next choice, uh, and that is Burnt Sugar by Avni Doshi. Um, again, I spoke about it in my 2020 uh, Booker Prize video, but she, uh, Avni Doshi writes this brilliant uh, kind of inter-family drama between two characters, um, between Tara and Antara, um, her mother. And what for me is so, uh, sorry, the other way around, um, what for me is so clever about this is um how we watch because we're, we're watching all of this through one character's eyes and that character is full of so much venom and hatred um and disappointment and frustration for her mother that um we see the whole thing through her eyes and are kind of 
predisposed in some ways to feel that way about her mother. But then when we see this kind of ailing, weak woman sort of suffering from dementia towards the end of the book, we can't help but feel a bit sorry for her. And what's then really interesting for me is we are then set up almost in opposition to the main character because we want the mother to do well but at the same time we're watching and so do her family and everybody else is sort of rooting uh, for and sort of supporting the mother and this character um, Antara is so annoyed because she can't get over the fact that everyone is happy to ignore how brutal and um, abusive in some ways and, and horrible her mother had been to her um, and she almost wants her mother to recover not because no, not to not so she's not ill but so she can remember what she's done to her and that i think is so powerful it takes again real courage i think to write a character like that and to do it so powerfully it, it really stays with you and i don't want to spoil it but the final scene for me i know some people had an issue with the ending but for me the final scene is kind of perfect um, and that's what for me made it one of my top books of the year because there's this moment where we suddenly see things from a slightly different perspective but again I don't want to ruin it but I really want to talk about it um and that's so powerful uh, because you just suddenly see all of the kind of cards falling and yeah it's brilliant so yeah for me this is the book that had Shoggy Bay not won this is the book I wanted to win um, I think both of them are incredible I recommend you check out both of them um and yeah I mean it's I'm very glad that the Booker Prize brought these books into my life this year. Next up is a book that made the Booker Prize long list and controversially not the short list. But I think everybody has heard a lot about this book already, and that is The Mirror and the Light by Hilary Mantel. Um, so this is capping off her trilogy of uh, the Wolf Hall trilogy about uh, Thomas Cromwell. Um, so that's all about his sort of rise and fall. Um, and so we see this real rise um, in the first two books, and then we know that his fall is coming in this third book. Um, and Hilary Mantel was sort of saying herself that she found it really quite difficult to put it down and finish the final bits um, because she'd lived inside these worlds for so long. You know, Wolf Hall came out in 2009 and she'd started writing it a good amount before then. Um, part of the reason I also put this book on my list is uh, I, I mean, Wolf Hall, I didn't necessarily get on with that well, but for me, Bring Up the Bodies and The Mirror and the Light are just two pieces of incredible fiction um, based in a sort of real situation. But the way that Hilary Mantel is able to get inside the heads of these characters to create a whole world around, around everything, around everyone, um, is so brilliantly done. I think it's so clever that we know the ending but kind of don't know how exactly we're going to get there even if you're sort of someone who's quite up on history i'm not as it happens with the, <laughs> the tudor period um but i think that's the thing that's so fascinating about this is you just get this real in-depth focus all the way through um and it never feels like you're bogged down with 200 pages of here's how things were happening in the country it's all told through the personal perspective and i think what's kind of great about that is for the characters living that world they wouldn't know what's going to happen next year or they wouldn't necessarily put it in the wider context of 20 years ago this law was passed and then this led to this thing you know in, in the way that we look at history sort of from the future um that's what i think is so great about this we we live these worlds as the characters are experiencing them it's not like oh this is the 1649 land act um they just an act happens and people are arguing with each other and you know all of these characters are trying to take each other down um and so we know that cromwell's not going to last much longer but we kind of want to see how he's going to go down who's going to betray him who's going to destroy him um i read this really early into lockdown and it was nice to have the time for it because it's a big book um and yeah i just think again hillary mantel just knocks it out of the park um for me bring up the the bring up the bodies and this book together are just such a genius sort of um you know 1300 pages or so of um historical fiction and wolf Hall's good it's just i didn't like full on love it um but it was needed for the setup for all of this of about 2000 pages in total of hilary mantel talking about thomas cromwell which doesn't you know on sort of first uh, first thoughts sound like it's going to be the best thing ever uh, i was really impressed by this but as someone who doesn't necessarily always like historical fiction i could not help but kind of be in awe of her writing on this 
And finally, another book that made the Booker Prize long list, but unfortunately didn't make the short list, and for me is one of the best of that long list, um, is Love and Other Thought Experiments by Sophie Ward. Um, so this book, I think, is a really interesting concept and idea, and Sophie Ward herself did a PhD to basically get herself to, to doing this book, um, which is taking sort of thoughts, taking various sort of uh, philosophical thought experiments and applying them to kind of characters sort of lives um so you've got the idea of um things existing or not existing about the kind of meaning of things and that's all sort of channeled through these characters on the surface i thought this should not work um and i was sort of fully prepared for this to um be something that i enjoyed but you know kind of quite happily put down i think there's always the danger actually as well with things that are long listed but not short listed for prizes is there's sort of sometimes an assumption in your head that that book is less than another one um whereas obviously it's just judges choices right it's whatever they liked best or didn't or you know didn't at the time and if you had a different set of judges it might have been entirely different i i love this i raced through it i found the character stories really compelling um, particularly once they really start interweaving and it's actually really emotional at the end it's something i was completely unprepared for particularly a book that is so full of ideas around thought experiments this idea at the end about sort of two separate timelines or about two sort of worlds kind of uh, interacting or not interacting it's really quite heartbreaking it almost felt kind of video game like and i mean that in a really positive sense in the it felt so sort of dreamscapey that I kind of felt like I was part of it and there was these sort of simulations and a really involving piece of work and one that I just think is, is brilliant. Um, I kind of can't believe this didn't make the shortlist in some ways uh, but I get that it's a bit, experimental, uh, a bit experimental and a bit more of a push out there um, but I really recommend that you go and check out Love and Other Thought Experiments. I just think it's a really underrated um work from this year um lonesome reader um eric has a um an interview with her um which i'll also link to because i just think it's a really brilliant um look at just how um she kind of came to creating the the book and kind of her thoughts around it ever since um so yeah brilliant brilliant book and those have been uh, some of my favorite books released this year um that i just absolutely adored and thought you know everybody should kind of try and check out um again there are so many other books that couldn't make this list that i also really enjoyed a lot of the booker prize long list for example um, i'm currently reading through the booker international shortlist um and there are some gems in there as well you know so so many brilliant books are released this year and in a year where we've probably needed reading and the kind of comforts of reading and alone time perhaps more than ever um and I just I just think this has been such a great year for, for books and um, for really sitting down and enjoying them. Again, obviously feel zero pressure if you've not been able to read that much this year. Um, I know that for parts of this year I, I really couldn't read that much because I just found it all too overwhelming and my brain was all kinds of everywhere. Uh, but I hope that you've been able to enjoy some really good quality books. Uh, please do recommend some uh, in the comments if I've missed any, because I'm sure there are tons and tons of really good books this year that I have just completely not even registered. Um, but yes, apart from all of that, I hope you have a really great, uh, a really great uh, end of this year. I um, hope 2020 goes well for you. And uh, as always, enjoy your reading. Take care. Bye bye.